Okay, getting back to where, where, where we're at here, we're, we're, we're looking at interrupts right here, and I'm going to I'm going through this again from the scratch because one is that there will be questions on the final on the interrupt, so knowing the information from this these slides would be helpful for you up there. So there, an interrupt is an occurrence that causes temporary suspension. We've talked about this before. Something happens and we want our program to stop what it's doing and do something else. It allows us to respond asynchronously to an event. This is highlighted there. Deal with an event in the, while in the middle of performing another task. Interrupt-driven systems give the illusion, and that, that's a big key there, is that this processor, as in mic, all microcontrollers, are single core processors, that there are, there are some ARM processors that are multi-core that can have, when I talk about multi-core processor, it means that there's more than one processor on a single chip. We have not talked about multi-core. But when you look at, for example, a lot of the AMD processors, I know the one that I've got on my computer at home, it's got six cores on, on, on the chip that there. Some of the uh, ARM processors will have dual cores. Uh, anybody have a have a uh, Sam, Samsung uh, S3, you know, S3 phone or an S4 or the uh, S5 or any of those four, form, or phones, you quite often hear the term that they're dual core or octa core phones, they, they have four cores. The processors we're dealing with only have one core, which means that they can do one thing at a time. Right there. So when you have an interrupt, the processor's doing something an interrupt causes it to stop what it's doing and do something else temporarily. So it appears like it's doing multiple things simultaneously. That they're. We're going to be writing in capital letters the interrupt service routine or interrupt handler right there. That's what we're going to be looking at at the end of today's lecture. We're going to go through that there. So the ISR executes a response to an interrupt and generally performs an input or output. Interrupt service routines can do anything right there. So again, when the interrupt occurs, it temporarily suspends operations and branches to the ISR. Yeah, right there. The, you know, the only thing different between the ISR when we write this is we're going to have to tell the, the subroutine that's interrupt. I showed you how to do that in, in assembly language by just putting at the end interrupt 14 or interrupt 15. In C, you do it a little bit differently. It's a little bit cleaner in C, but my example I'll show you at the end today is using C. So we're going to be using the interrupt sir. return from interrupt. It's, it's, it's different from the normal return because it has to pop off the return address. Right there. A normal call, which is how you would call it a normal subroutine, doesn't push the return address onto the stack, nor does the return automatically pop it back off accordingly. Well, it does pop it back off, but right there. But it's a little bit different because this also saves the status of the processor. Because remember, we don't know what the processor was doing. So the program status word, the register sets, a lot of that stuff is saved right there. So this is the flow. This is a little bit different than the flow. And this is probably a little cleaner than what I showed before. But, you know, when we, when, when, whenever we do it, you know, whenever we do the reset, we start our main routine. Because remember, reset is also an interrupt, but the only thing we usually put in the interrupt service routine is a long jump to main, right? That's our main routine, right there. The interrupt occurs, the program counter is pushed onto the stack, along with the registers are pushed onto the stack. Now the stack, of course, is a last in, first out, so we reverse the order when we pop things off. So the program counter is pushed on the stack, followed by the registers, not there. We execute our interrupt service routine. Whatever code we write, we execute that. We pop the, the registers off the stack in the reverse order in which they are pushed on. Again, we don't have to do this. The, the, the code will do this for us, the compiler, when it sees that this is an interrupt routine. It's going to take care of that there. And then it's going to pop the program counter last off the count off the stack and continue to execute the code. So this is the chain of events that occurs 
when an interrupt happens right there. So, you know, you probably should put this slide somewhat in the memory right there. Mm. You know, in other words, you need to know these this chain of events up there. Here we're getting a little bit more technical. I'm not up there. You don't necessarily have to up there know all this. This is for the F020, which is very similar to the three. We're using the F850, which is just a smaller chip in terms of I.O. It has fewer external interrupts. It only has interrupt zero right there, and interrupt, interrupt one, I don't believe it has. It still has the five timers, and it has one serial port right there. But these are all the various interrupts that we can occur. The example I'm going to do, go through today is using the timer. The timer is the most common one that, that we will use. Each interrupt source has one or more flags associated with it in the, in the special function register. We can look at that there. So when a peripheral or external source calls an interrupt, that their, the associated interrupt pending flag is set to one. So we can see what interrupt's being called right there. These flags are level sensitive in that the flag is, will not be cleared in the interrupt service routine either by hardware. The interrupt will occur again right there. So if it's a hardware interrupt right there, what's going to happen is it's going to keep calling itself. So usually the first thing you have to do if you're dealing with an external hardware interrupt that's level driven is you have to disable it so it doesn't keep calling itself. That there. It's going to, that there. So you usually, you know, that would be the first thing. Today's example, we won't be doing that. We'll, we'll clear it, but we, that there. This is kind of a list of the interrupts right there. This is similar to what we looked at before. This table here is the interrupt vector that there. You'll see that there's the first one is the reset. It's only got three bytes. Zero, one, and two are assigned to it. So that's why on the reset we always have a long jump to around the rest, rest of the table. Interrupt zero is at location three. That's a hardware pin that comes into it there. That there. We've got three three bits assigned to it. One is the IE0. That's the that simply tells us that's on timer condition one, bit one, or the timer that's a special function register, bit one, that says that that interrupts occurred. We can enable it with IE.0 right there, and we can set its priority right there. And we won't get into that much detail. Uh, timer overflow is here. There's the priority, and we can, again we can control its prior priority. Then. We're going to be using timer overflow of two, which is the fifth. It's got the t t two con dot seven tells us that this is an overflow, and we'll talk about timers in a in a few minutes here. There, and these are the associated enable flags and priority controls, and we can see that we've also got several others here. I'm going to just concentrate on the timer one today, but. Again, all these interrupts have interrupt service routines, you know, a vector in the interrupt vector table, right there, attached to it. And you can see this list goes on and on and on, right there. We have 22 of these up there. In the event of two simultaneous interrupts, or an interrupt occurring while another one can be serviced, there is both a fixed and programmable program, programmable levels to schedule the interrupts. So. Typically, what that says is if we're servicing over timer overflow zero and timer over, timer one overflows, we're going to ignore it while we're servicing that. that there. So we, so these have a priority. Which ones are more important than, than others? Now, remember when you first power this up on reset, all the interrupts other than the reset are disabled. Right there. So, that there. There are both a fixed order and two programmable priority of the schedule of the interrupts. But there, I'm not going to go through a lot of this in great detail. Each of the interrupts are enabled sources either through the interrupt enable special function register or the two extended registers. The 8051 only had one IE 
special function register for enable the interrupts. Because the Silicon Labs has added so many additional interrupt sources, because the uh, 8051 only had INT0 in the two timers and a couple others, it only had the one special function register, IE. IE EIE1 and EIE2 are extended interrupt enable special function registers to handle the fact that there's now 22 sources versus the original out there. In addition to each enable, there's a global bit in that there, IE.7, that disables all interrupts or turns on all enabled interrupts. So this bit 7, and I can't get too far away from there. If you clear that bit 7, all the interrupts other than reset have been disabled. Right there. Now remember, the watchdog timer is tied to the reset. So you have to, the watchdog timer is not part of the interrupt structure. That, that generates an, a reset when it, when it flags up there. So, but if you clear EA, in other words, you set EA equal to 0, then you, you're going to disable all interrupts other than the reset. If you set it to one, you don't enable all interrupts, only the ones you want to interrupt to set. So you can either clear them all or you enable selected interrupts right there. Now you cannot disable the reset right there. Typically two bits must be set to enable an interrupt. So th this is an important line right here in the fact that if we want to set an interrupt, enable an interrupt, we have to do two things. We have to enable that particular interrupt by itself and enable all of, you know, the, the, the global interrupt. I'm going to call it the global enable or disable. So there's two bits up there. Some interrupts need more than two. We're not going to worry too much about that there. And of course, interrupt zero is, I keep pointing out, is the reset. You can't disable that particular one up there. And the reset pin, of course, is goes to the microprocessor, and you just power up that there. I'm not going to dwell on these right here. Can be individually programmed one lower high. That they're typically, we're not going to get into that. This idea of playing around with the interrupt priorities, but you can do that there. These three, there's three special function registers. That they're each interrupt is going to be individually programmed to one of the priorities, high or low. That there, you set a one to make it a higher priority or low to make it a low priority. To be interrupted by a higher priority than the one currently needed. Again, that goes back to my example of the nurse. You know, the nurse is in room 23, fluffing the patient's pillow, adjusting their bed. The heart monitor goes off in room 29 down the hall. What does she do? She she tells the patient she'll be back, and she goes down and checks on the heart monitor. You know, calls code blue, gets a crash card in there, does whatever th th they do whenever someone's heart stops beating. There. I don't know about hospitals here. We also have things like do not resuscitate orders where they don't do anything. But regardless, they're going to deal with the higher priority first. You know, the patient whose who's heart to stop beating is more important than the one who's complaining about his feet are cold and needs, needs a blanket, right? That there. Same thing if they're in patient room 29 dealing with the heart rate monitor and the patient 23 hits that buzzer 23 times wanting their pillow fluffed. They're, they're going to ignore that patient, right? That's where this priority level comes into, is that not all interrupts are created equal. You know, you've got a gasoline pump that's pumping gas all over the ground. That's a higher priority than someone wanting to swipe a credit card in, right there. So you deal with it there. So, so again, the key thing there is a low priority, low priority, Interrupt service routine is can be preempted by a high priority, but not the other way around. So that's where that priority table came into. And again, this is the default priority table right here. Right there. That's the default priority table. But again, you can always go over here and you can adjust the priority to put it below all the others. Right there. So okay, having two priorities useful to require immediate actions that they're Again, a timer requires because of delay response, motor be damaged. That there, others such as forward reverse has to take action. 
they used to wait a few milliseconds. You know, this is an example. A keypad interrupt, for example, is set to a low priority. Somebody presses a button. You remember, we're talking milliseconds here. You know, that there are possibly even microseconds when we're talking about the time it takes to service these interrupts. So it, it is a, we're not talking hours. <laughs> no, we're talking that they're, again, same thing with priority, same priority, fixed priority of service first, but there, again, this is just getting the priorities up there. Okay, some interrupt are automatically cleared by hardware when it res resets. You know, for example, if you serve as a timer, when you go to the ISR, it automatically clears that interrupt, serve, you know, flag right there. However, most are not cleared by the hardware, must be cleared by software before returning. So, again, you have to look at which ones are have to be cleared manually up there. And I don't know, I, I didn't scare everybody with that big 300, 400 page document that covers everything about this processor. That's where this information is buried into which ones are covered and which ones are not up there. And it's a little bit beyond the scope of an introduction to microprocessor class, but read that there. If an interrupt remains set after the CPU completes that, a new interrupt will be up there. So this is where the danger comes in. This is the issue that I'm trying to get across. Is we go out, we service this interrupt, and if I walk away from here, my voice will fade and you, the recording will be, be lost. But there, if, if you go out and you service a, a routine and you don't clear the flag, then as soon as we hit the inter return from interrupt, it's going to go right back and service that interrupt again. You have to clear the interrupt, is what this is saying there. You have to do that there. Now, you can also disable an interrupt, and the interrupt flag is just simply ignored. That's just like the nurse unplugged, unscrewed the light bulb from room 23. He's called her 25 times to, to, to adjust the blanket. Not getting anything done, so unscrew the light bulb. You know, we're basically going to ignore that. That there. You know, you turn off the ringer to your phone when you go to bed at night. Or, I don't know if you do or not, but I do because I've got friends back in the U.S. that don't know how to tell time and time zones, and they'll call me at four in the morning without realizing it's four in the morning where I'm at. Up there, so so it's one of those cases that you will just, you know, when you disable and interrupt, you're basically ignoring. It. You know, you put your phone on vibrate. You know, you don't want to go off in a meeting. Those types of things. So we've got the two, and I'm going to kind of fly through these here. Up there. The pins for the external interrupts are allocated assigned by the crossbar. Again, this goes back to that crossbar. You have to know that what is the purpose of the crossbar? It's to, to assign I.O. pins according to which ones you need for your particular application. We've only got, I think we counted 20 pins on this particular processor right there. Actually, I think we counted 22 pins. It's bigger than I thought it was right there. Uh, we counted 11 on each side, but we've only got so many pins on this processor. And if you look at all the various things we can connect to it, we have to assign our pins that we want to use accordingly to which ones we want to use. So that's where the crossbar comes in. That there, we have to tell the crossbar we want to use interrupt zero. And that notice that it does have the little knot in front of that, so that's an active low knot. That are allocated sign of the crossbar. They're configured by the these two bits. We're not going to get into that much detail, but again, they're enabled by using the external, i.e., zero and one right there. You know that's in the that's in the standard 8051 core that there, and we have two flags right there to serve as that there's a pending interrupt, in there, and we can go and see that there's an interrupt. We can, and this is kind of an interesting thing. It's a little beyond where 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 you would get into this. There, we can set up these timer, these external interrupts, to be either edge triggered or level triggered. Does anybody know what I mean by edge triggered? It occurs when the clock, when the input goes from low to high or high to low, depending on whether it's an active. These are active low, right there. So whenever that, whenever it goes, that pin goes low, 
during the time it goes low, the interrupt will trigger. It can stay low forever, it won't trigger again. It has to go high, then back low again. That's an edge trigger. Level trigger means that it's going to be triggered as long as that input is low out there. So it's it's like the input to a D flip-flop. You can, It's either a clock or it's a gate. You know, if we look at the address slash enable, that's a gate out there. So in other words, as long as that pin is, that the ALE is high, then that latch is going to latch it there. When it goes low, whatever was last there is going to stay there. These, so we can configure these to be other level up there. We're not going to do any of that in this class here. We're not going to worry about that. But just have an interesting note that you can have level triggering and you can have edge triggering. Extra on your up there. We have a register here. This is our timer. Here, basically our interrupt that there is. We look at this tank table right here. Is we've got timer one overflow. Timer one is running. Timer zero overflow. Timer zero run control. External interrupt right there. One interrupt once. Select whether it's edge or edge or, or level zero. That there same as. E1 but applies to that there. In other words, it's a external that there, and we've got edge return. So this is our standard T card that we can either read or write. We can see whether or not timer one is overflowed. We can see whether or not timer one is is, is is running or not running. We can look to see whether time zero is overflowed or whether it's running. We can look to see whether external interrupt that's INTR, INT0 or INT INT1 not, whether or not that has been triggered. We can set INT1 to be edge or, edge or level trig trigger, and same thing with INT0. So with these are the ones that are built into the 8051 right there. We also have some extra that can be used for two other external port 3.6 and 3.7, which we don't have on, on, our, on our processor. So this is actually for the, the F020 or F120 family. These, this slide does not apply to our our processor that we're using right there. So, that there. And then we've got several other, our external flags right there. These are the ones that are not on that there. This is our inter interrupt enable register. There's three of those for this particular processor. And you can see EA, which is, this is a bit addressable port. So we can set EA is equal to one or zero. If we set it zero, we disable every interrupt other than reset. If we set it to one, then we enable that there. The general purpose flag, we don't use for, for anything. That's just a flag. But then we can see here that we can set our timer to interrupt, enable or disable it. Our UART, that there, that's our serial port. Our timer one. Our external interrupt one, our external interrupt zero, and external interrupt, uh, oh, timer zero, and the timer zero and external interrupt. So we, so if we want to use timer two, for example, we have to, we have to hit set both bit seven and five have to be set to one. We have to set both those bits high, right there, if we want to use that particular interrupt. If we want to use timer zero, we got to set bits seven and bit one high. Right there. Remember, we have to set both the individual t interrupt flag high or enable high and the global interrupt high. Right there. And then this table just goes on for the various other interrupts that we're adding. Again, we have a comparator that does that, that's looking at a couple of analog voltages. We're not we're worrying about that there. You know, there we've got the programmable array counter, which we're not going to worry about here. Our window comparison, which looks at our analog input there, enable system manage, SM bus, as a bus, bus SPI. These are these two bottom two are, are these are serial communication protocols that have been added on to the 8051 by Silicon Labs. That there, SM SM bus and SPI serial peripheral interface. Those are two additional serial types of ports. So you've got three different types of serial ports on this processor. And they all use interrupts. And then again, the external clock that there, you know, that's if you want a counting events, UR1, 
extra linear up seven and six in the conversion up there. So if we're using our analog to digital converter, one or zero, whenever it's done doing a conversion, it will trigger an interrupt for us to process that analog input right there. So we start the conversion right there, disable the that there, once it's done, it triggers an interrupt. So we don't have to sit there and wait for it to, you know, up there. So this is our priorities up there. And again, you know, if you set one, you set to a high priority level, if you leave it zero, it's the, the default order. So again, these are all these various pin ports that they're, again, priority, I'm not gonna go through all of these. We could spend hours going through this up there. That's everything on interrupts that I have right there. Now, is that, uh, okay. Now let's talk a little bit about timers. Oh, this is our 294 page document right up there that, that I keep referring to. That's the data sheet that's got everything buried in right there. I wanted to bring up open, Oh, do the desktop. I stole that there. I thought I already had it open. Why true? Okay. What have we got here? All right, I had it here. What what happened up there? Okay, give me a second here. I thought I had it open here. Open, uh, I had it open earlier. It was in that register. It's not on the desktop there. It should be right here under lectures. It's not there. Okay, well then I will not go. Where is it? I had it open in my office. Right there. Okay. Don't tell me. Eric. Okay, it's right there. Oh, because I'm trying to open I'm trying to open it with, with Adobe there. Okay, this is the one I want right here. Okay, these are the timers. Now, a timer is exactly what it is. It's a reg special register that will increment every so often depending on what we generate. We have multiple things we need to generate with a timer out there. And we have, again, multiple timers here. Timer zero is an 8-bit auto reload in mode two programming sequence up there. We'll, we'll look at that. Generator timers on over there. Timer three is also a 16-bit auto reload mode right there where we can generate interrupts. When we say auto over, over reload means it's going to generate an interrupt and then it's going to reload back the same value and start counting again. Now when what, what we do is we load the timer up with a number, it counts up until it gets to 16 bit, until it gets to F, 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 and then the next count after F, 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 four Fs is zero, 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 zero. When it goes from four Fs to zero, 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 it triggers the interrupt. So we can control how long it takes to get to that before between the inter interrupts. So we preload that there. We also can tell it what clock we want to use as far as doing our timing right there. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at Blinky, and we're going to look at Blinky using the timer instead of using the, the nested net loops there. So again, there, 
so at time intervals is programmed to overflow at a certain interval and the following, we set the timer overflow, which it generates the interrupt. It's used to synchronize format at certain particular points that they're used to generate. We can generate square waves at certain frequencies. We can use it to generate something called pulse width modulation to control the speed of a motor, for example. So we can set up a timer as a pulse width modulator that's going to have a that's going to be on for say 60% of the time and off 40% of the time. So these timers are very, very powerful in terms of control applications. We can do event counting now. And event counting means that we've got, say for example, a wheel that's got some type of Hall effect sensor or something like that that's going around and every time you know, it, it goes in a circle, it's going to tr trigger a pulse. It's going to generate a pulse. And we can calculate the speed of a conveyor belt or a or an automobile or something like that by counting pulses right there. So we can do event counting. And we can also generate baud generations for using the serial ports that there. Serial ports have to occur at a particular baud rate. So you know, for example, 9600 baud means that there's 9600 bits per second generated. 19.2 100, 19K.200 baud means that basically it's 19.K2, that 19,200 19, bits per second are generated. So we have to send and receive bits at a uniform pattern. So we use these timers to set up our baud rate for, for serial communications right there. So this particular processor has five counters and timers. We're going to look at you know, multiple ones that there. These may vary slightly between the one we've got. We're going to be using a timer that's set up as a 16-bit without a reload capture. So we've got the various modes right there. As we look at the modes, you can see that timer 2 in mode 1 is a 16-bit counter timer without a reload. Timer 4 can be operated in mode 1. Timer three can only be operated in mode zero. So all, the, so we've got not just you know five counters and timers, but we've got different modes that they can be operated with. And again, we could spend hours talking about that. I'm not going to dwell on that there. So the the programming sequence there, and again, I'm going to skip over to an example. But we set we, we set the clock. It could be the system clock or the system clock divided by 12. Right there. So normally we would use the system clock divided by 12. Right there. That there. Timer 3, overload, again, same basic thing. Select the TX3, the frequency. Right there. Timer 2, again, desired system clock frequency. And we can select the various ones right there. So again, I'm not going to dwell on this. I'm just going to show you an example of this because if you ever have to sit down and use a timer, you're going to pull the data sheet out and look at examples. You're not going to remember all these steps. I don't remember all these steps that there. But you know, once you use them a few times, it comes out fairly, fairly well. You know, the, here's a summary of, of the functions, special function registers right there. And you can see here timer 2. We've got our timer two control, our low and high byte captures, our capture if we're counting events, and these are our current counts right there. TL2 and TH2, those are our current counts right there. And that there. Again, I'm not gonna go through all, all this here. I'm gonna just kinda skip through here. Timer two, you go through. This, is, this shows the commands for doing that. Again, you, you look at right here, now here we're going to use the system clock divided by 12, right here. We, we set that, that particular bit high, right there. And you, and you go, through, go through and you set, this is, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're clearing this bit right there. Right there. So, again we go through, and this is just examples of how to do that. I'm going to just kind of flip through here, make sure I don't, cover anything right here. Timer clear. 
programming sequence right there extended tables right there timer two set select the desired clock frequency write the the auto reload into the capture up there using the auto reload mode and then start write the count up sequence registers select the mode to turn it you know set the to turn it on and you can see there there's that nice neat nasty little table right there Uh, from current slide right there you can see this there's that nasty little table here there there's our overflow flag there's our external flag our all of our various reserve clock for UART if we're using it for the UART there's our external enable up right there run control enables disables it our that there whether what clock we want to use I'm just going to go through an example right there mode configuration right here again we're looking at here's our various modes that we want to use it for we turn it on TR2 tur turns on this is with capture without a reload we set it in this mode right here and there's a programming example we'll, we'll look at another one here in a second that defines the clock timer 2 uses the system clock divided by 12 if you want to use a system clock, you set the 20 right there, and you set the, the various functions right there. This is the one thing right here is this is the count right there. It is it initialized reload value. Is that sets how long we, we want it to count right there. And this is a negative value because we're going to start, we're going to count up. So we put a negative value in there. So as we look at our example right here, under this mode, as a normal 16 bit timer setting that there, an interrupt is generated, it's enabled to load the current value into the cap on the following edge right there. So let me just jump in here. And as I said, we're probably at there. Hey, let's look at the example here. I, I'm, I think that's probably it on these slides here that I want to talk about here. Yeah, I deleted the rest of the slides. Let's jump in here and let's look at some code here. Right here, let's look at, this is Blinky. This is Blinky modified. Right here. And what I've done on Blinky here is I set the system clock right here in Hertz, right here. This is the Find system clock is that's our frequency divided by eight. So we're going to do the divide by eight right here. And what we've done here is we've we're going to initialize our timer and we're going to tell it divide by twelve by ten. This ten is our reset is our is our rate at which we want to do that there. If you try by one, it's actually not going to work because it's going to overflow. Well, we'll play with that number right there. We set our we set our global interrupts right down here, and we, we come down here. This is the routine where everything happens right here. This is our this is our, the magical routine right here, right there. That everything's going to happen here, and this is the one that you spend time spending right there. This initializes timer two, so we stop the timer and we clear it, and we're going to use clock divided by twelve as the time base based on TX clock right there so and again this that command comes from looking up the data sheet on setting that up that's the default is that our system clock divided by 12 is going to be our timer clock so every 12 clock cycles this timer is going to increment one right there so then we're going to right there and that's the, the 60 clock based on that clock there so, so these two commands set that up in order to do the divide by 12 right there then we're going to load this with how long we want this to count now that's a negative number right there now as it turns out if we pull up our calculator right here we're feeding it 
our system clock. Right there. Yeah, what is that? Okay, we're we're going to feed it the system clock. Our system clock, remember, is twenty four five hundred divided by eight. So 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 we've set this up to so find my calculator here. Right here, we're going to just I'm just gonna use calculator pro. So we're going I will work in decimal here. So we're going to feed this 245, and how many zeros is that? Five zeros, right? Yeah, five zeros. That's 24.5 megahertz that there, and we're doing a divide by eight. So our system clock is right at three megahertz right there. Then we're feeding this thing a divide by 12, so we divide that by 12 again, right there. So we're at 255 kilohertz, right there. So what we want to do, at this particular case right there, is we divide that by 10 again, and I've got 25,520 is what I've got, right there. Now that's what we're going to feed that to feed into that only we're going to negative we want to go up that far up right there's what we want want to do we want to go that far up right there so we're just simply going to pass that there and that should give us you know what we're passing that there is here this here is the, the amount of time for one second right there that's one second right there and we're going to divide by 10 now if we if we times that times ten, we're at two hundred fifty six thousand. You know that's more than we've only got sixteen bits that there. We divide by ten, and we're going to feed it that. We're going to give it a negative number right there. So we've got sixteen bits registered right there. So what we're going to do here, and, and we'll see how that how this plays out here, right there. So so we simply load that into our and we give that a negative because we want this to count up. So we're going to put a negative number in there. That there. If we make that a smaller number, then it's going to take longer to count up. If we make it a bigger number, it's going to take less time. So by playing with this number right here, we can put just a number in there. What we're doing here is we're calculating the number based on the fact that we know that we're using our system clock divided by 8 is our system clock, our crystal or our internal clock. And then we're dividing by 12 again. That gives us one second right there if we pass it that there. And we're going to divide by 10 in order to get a tenth of a second. So if we took this 10 out, that would give us a one second delay. Well, we can't get a one second delay with this timer. Not there. It's just, it's just impossible. It's only got 16 bits right there. So FFF is what? Our, our, if we loaded it with zero, Right there, let me pull up another calculator. If we loaded it with zero, accessible. this thing doing its thing. Okay, here's what we want. F, 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 F. Convert binary. That's 65,000 is what is the largest number we give, give it there. And we're passing it something much smaller than that right there. We're, we're, we're passing something smaller. So if I run this right here, what we're going to see here, if I compile this, right, excuse me, all that does is it's going to generate a, an interrupt every tenth of a second there. And all we do when we, inter, when we hit the interrupt, and notice that the way that I did this here is this is now an interrupt routine. This is the keyword in C. It's timer 2 interrupt service routine and interrupt timer 2. That's, that's just a keyword. And every time that timer interrupts, 
it's going to toggle that LED, that flag LED right there. So if we compile this and we download that there, we go there and we'll see this thing is blinking about 10 times a second right there. If I stop this and let's just for sake of argument I'm going to put a dash dash here and I'm just going to put the number zero here right here and uh oh doesn't like the number zero doesn't like the number zero Oh, because I put the wrong bracket there. And I download it, download it here. You'll notice that it's slower, much slower. That's the slowest I can make it go with, with this particular timer. Because I'm loading it with zero and it's going all the way to F, 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 F before it overflows. If I put in there, say some other number other than zero, let's just put in the number, you know, let's just take this number here, you know, let's divide that by five, download it, and you'll notice that it should go much, much, it goes faster. I divide it by 10, which is going to give it a larger number. You see how quickly it's up there. If I change it to 20, it's going to go very quickly. See, it's just flying through there. It's going very, very quickly. So, but what this, what we're doing here with this timer right here, and, and again, the, the only thing that does is set that pin, that pin so like it's a push pull so that I can turn the LED off. All we're doing here is, is these two lines here are telling it what to use for the clock here. This tells us how long we want to count right there. Right there. And this that just tells it to reload and set the reload immediately. This en enables the timer and starts it. Whenever an interrupt occurs, all we do is we clear the interrupt, interrupt right there. We're clearing that flag so it doesn't keep interrupting right there. And we toggle the LED. This is our interrupt service routine. Every time this timer overflows, all we're going to do is turn, is toggle the, tell it, Clear the interrupt and toggle the LED. If we want this to do more things, we can do more things right there. But this is the simplest way of showing you how an interrupt works. The, again, the timer, the key there is, without getting into a lot of details, the first two lines of that function just basically tell us, <coughs> tell, tell the, tells the timer, again, you would just use this code, you'd steal it from somewhere, a data sheet or something that there, that we want to stop the timer, clear it, and use the system clock divided by 12 as our time base that there. And timer clock right there in these on this particular timer to external clock right there. In other words, it's going to, you know, we're setting up where we want this thing to toggle from. So we're, we're doing this, we're doing a divide by System clock, we're using the divide by 8, and then we're dividing by 12 again. So we're taking our system clock, and we're dividing it down considerably, and then we're telling it where to start counting from. And it counts up from this point here. When it hits the FFFFF and recycles, then it goes on to the, then it triggers the interrupt. And this just tells, these two just tell it to start the time three. Tells it to reload immediately, 
and just start enable the timer interrupt right there and start the timer so you've got three three bits that we're setting right here for the interrupt here's bit one that we're setting for the interrupt ea is equal to one that's our global interrupt flag down here we're we're setting we're enabling the timer interrupt that's et2 that goes back to our And ET2 is right there. That's our timer to interrupt. That's again that's defined in the 850.h F850.h file, the you know the include file that sets up all that. So it knows that ET2 is bit five in the IE register. Right there. It knows that that's the case there. So, and then we also tell it to start the timer right there, and that's TR2, that's in the timer register right there. So that's really everything that there. It kind of gives you a feel for how interrupts occur, because if you look at this main routine right here, you know, if you look at, you know, what happens after EA1, what does this program do? while one. It does nothing, right? That, those are empty brackets. It doesn't do anything. So this program should go go into an infant loop and just lock. It should do nothing. But because of this interrupt right here generated right here, because of this interrupt we're going to go through and we're going to toggle this LED every tenth of a second, every fifth of a second. I think it's every twentieth of a second right now. But, there, but we're toggling this LED right here is what we're doing right there. So again, this is set up in such a way right here that we're passing at the system clock divided by 12 divided by 20 right here. Up there. And again, our system clock is, you know, system clock in hertz right there. We're defining that right there. Any questions on this? I mean, this is pretty much in a nutshell up there. Um, tomorrow we will probably go ahead and we'll start talking about the next lab which is going to be basically using the, we're going to be using the timer somewhat right there right there because what we're going to be doing is basically a small <coughs> counter where we're going to but well, we're going to have to put a loop in here in order to let, let me think about tomorrow right there I got someone coming in to observe the lecture so I gotta look like I know what I'm talking about right there right there but um, there are any any questions I this this is confusing material I know but the key thing is knowing what an interrupt is in this particular case we've got a very simple interrupt right here here's a very simple interrupt right there all we do is just toggle the LED but we're doing this, if you remember the last one we did, we went into this infinite loop that just simply decremented. Our processor should be doing, if we're using our processor the way it should be, should be doing something here instead of just while one. Out there. It could be doing other things. All we're demonstrating here is the fact that we're using almost zero processor time doing a timer. The timer is doing all of our time delay then. Not our nested four next, our nested loops right there. And we actually got tighter control here because we can just go through here and just by changing one number here, five may or not work. Because if I if I try, if I do this, what you'll see is you'll get an error right here. Oh, it doesn't work, but it's going to. Oh, it does. That timer is big enough. You see, now it's about once a second up there. So, so I can easily control our speed up there, only because I'm used to this without the divide by twelve. So, if I want to do this, you know, now, now if I change this to six, for example, in, in order to do it, cut it in half. At some point, 
it'll explode on me because you know, you know it's not slowing down any. It's still going up there. Right there. You see, you do a whole lot less calculation, so it'll change the speed once it's set up. Right there. But the takeaway today is one is we have to go through a process of setting up the timer. We really didn't get too deep into that, and I don't intend to get too deep into that. The, that that topic there, but the interrupt service routine is the key thing that we're looking at. Is that whenever at this timer overflows, it triggers a interrupt, and this routine is executed. And we tell the compiler with the word interrupt right here that this is an interrupt service routine. We tell it here what type of interrupt it's going to be right there. Again, these are defined in there. The, the Kyle compiler, this uses a compiler by a company named Pop Kyle, is smart enough to know when it sees that to also put the code in there to load into, into the interrupt vector table the long jump to this here. And to put in the end of this the RTI. And we can actually put a, let me put a break here. Here, what? Well, I'm not quite done here. Let me put a break. right here. And what you'll see here is that right here that this is the code that's actually generated by the compiler and you'll notice that it clears C8.7 that's at TF 2h equals 0, it clears that bit, then it complements 90.h, which is our port 0, 1.0, right there, and then it does the return from interrupt right there. If I single step through this, you notice that, notice what that command is. Anybody recognize that command? What's that command set? say? Short jump to where? To itself. It just keeps, it just, it, it never goes anywhere, right? It doesn't go anywhere. If I hit the go, then of course it's going to end up back here again. Right there. So, and I can reset this processor. And you can step through this step by step and see what happens here. Move. You're just see. Move, jump not zero. And it's doing our thing here. It's clearing the right there. Yeah, it's just it's just spinning right there, doing nothing. And we tell it to go. It's now. Oh, I had the wrong button. Oh, it's flat. Right. When I when I recompiled it, it took the. Uh, up there and again, we can you can look at the code. Right here. I mean, put the brake right here. Oh, we need to put the brake here. Can reset the processor. 
Yeah, you can see that the court, it, it, it moves, it moved, it occurred A, it moved A to C8. It ended that there, complemented C that, again, that, that does the, um, that there, it subtracts there and moves that to R7. Where is that? Subtracts it. You can see it's going through and it's setting those bits and then it returns and then it just sits there and does nothing back there. It, it sets the interrupts and then it does nothing right there. It's, it's, it's stuck there. So you can see as it goes through the code that just like if we write, wrote this in assembly language, we would have the same code right there. Uh, it's just a little easier to do it than C. Right there. All right, with that said, I am going to stop this.